As if we humans don't have enough concerns in caring for our planet, a new worry is emerging that is apparently getting out of hand. Space junk. An estimated nine and a half tonnes of orbital trash is currently circling the Earth and there appears to be little concerted effort to clean it up. You may have heard of the 2009 Cosmos Iridium collision between two communications satellites. According to one aerospace scientist called Marie Bidjar, our response to the accidental collision, which generated massive amounts of floating space debris, was this century's equivalent to passengers on the Titanic feeling that first bump from an iceberg. Unfortunately, we haven't heeded the warning and the band continues to play on deck. Of those space junk objects large enough to be tracked, it has been estimated by the US Space Surveillance Network that around 20,000 whirl around our Earth. However, if smaller fragments are included, the current tally is closer to 130 million objects. Space debris ranges from nanoparticles to complete spacecraft, one being the European Space Agency's and VISIT, whose operations were terminated in 2011 and is the size of a double-decker bus. It includes many potentially harmful objects, such as discarded D-spin weights, which are solid chunks of metal. One of these came dangerously close to the International Space Station in 2009. At the other extreme are floating thermal blankets, which are paper thin, but can cause a different type of damage. According to space archaeologist Alice Gorman, the most concerning risks come from debris particles measuring between only 1 and 10 centimetres in size. In one recorded case, a fragment of paint the size of a fingernail struck the heavily reinforced windscreen of a space shuttle, piercing two of its three layers of glass. Recently, mission controllers at SpaceX headquarters in California cautioned orbiting astronauts to put on their spacesuits and return to their seats because a piece of space debris could strike the capsule. A particle the size of a grain of salt could puncture a spacesuit with dire consequences. There are many more of these tiny fragments than whole defunct spacecraft, and Gorman says that there is also a far greater probability of collision, which can damage working satellites and generate even more debris particles. With oceans and unpopulated regions covering most of the globe, it is statistically unlikely that a random piece of falling space debris would land in someone's suburban backyard. But there have been some close shaves in unexpected places. The first known report of damage caused by space debris was in 1969. A strange object, later identified as part of a Soviet spacecraft, had plummeted from space and hit a Japanese freighter sailing off the coast of Siberia, seriously injuring five crewmen. The possible hazards of space junk became even starker in 1978 when the downed nuclear-powered Soviet satellite Cosmos 954 scattered potentially radioactive debris across northwestern Canada. The massive cleanup operation involved seeking out and removing tiny pieces of radioactive material in the Arctic tundra, costing nearly 14 million Canadian dollars. Occasionally space junk has landed in farming or residential areas with amazingly no lives lost. In 1997, Lottie Williams was enjoying an early morning walk with friends in Tulsa Park, Oklahoma, when she noticed something like a shooting star which hurtled from the sky and hit her lightly on the shoulder. Scientists later identified the object as probably a piece of a US Delta II rocket. After the space shuttle Columbia broke apart in 2003 upon re-entering the atmosphere, causing the tragic loss of the seven astronauts on board, People in rural areas along the Texas-Louisiana border reported seeing pieces of the shuttle plummet into a reservoir. One even came crashing through the roof of a dentist's office. Around 84,000 pieces of the space shuttle were found in extensive searches through swamplands, forests and fields. That debris was then actually used to reconstruct the shuttle and discover the cause of the disaster. More recent incidents have seen a gigantic metal tube descend in the Ivory Coast 
and pieces of equipment found in Oregon and Washington State thought to have come from a SpaceX failed launch. Since 1957, the low Earth orbit has seen a build-up of high-speed clutter, which includes spent rocket stages, stray bolts and paint chips, solid rocket motor slag, moribund satellites and other scattered fragments, causing dangerous overcrowding in the celestial sphere. The problem is also poised to become much worse with the rise of satellite mega-constellations employing thousands of spacecraft from enterprises such as SpaceX, OneWeb and Amazon. It seems that the level of space junk has reached a tipping point beyond which the skies will become too crowded to be sustainable. According to Donald Kessler, a retired NASA senior scientist, inventing ways to start removing at least some of the space debris should be a top global priority. In the late 1970s, he predicted a scenario since dubbed the Kessler Syndrome, wherein, as the density of space rubbish increases, an exponential cycle of debris-generating collisions may arise which will ultimately make low Earth orbit too dangerous to maintain most space activities. Kessler recently commented that there is now agreement within the space community that the orbital environment has reached that crucial level where debris would continue to increase even if all launches were stopped. His cautionary statement is that it takes a collision such as the Iridium Cosmos disaster to get everyone's attention and that we are overdue for an incident like that to take place. Another downside of the accumulating space junk is that it is actually obscuring our view of the universe around us. Each and every object in orbit, from the tiniest scrap of space garbage to the largest human-made satellites, reflects an equivalent amount of sunlight back towards the Earth. Multiplied by the tens of millions, its aggregation amounts to a 10% increase in illumination across the night sky. That increased sky luminescence is washing out our view of the cosmos, making it more difficult for scientists to gaze out into the farthest reaches of our galaxy and the universe beyond. If the astronomers' calculations are correct, it means we've exceeded a sky brightness threshold for unhindered astronomical observation set decades ago by the International Astronomical Union. As more satellites are sent into orbit, all of Earth's countryside and wilderness areas will become brighter. It's now therefore conceivable that we may be hampering our capacity to detect hazardous asteroids on a collision course with our planet. According to John Barentine, Director of Public Policy at the International Dark Sky Association, the possibility that we may miss an object on a collision course with Earth is concerning. While there have been some attempts to start cleaning up the heavenly sphere, so far there appears to be no comprehensive solution. Many devices have been suggested, which have included nets, laser blasts, harpoons, giant foam balls, puffs of air, tethers and solar sails, and even garbage gathering robotic arms and tentacles. According to JAR, the biggest obstacle to an orbital cleanup is that its business case is not monetizable. Some progress has been made, albeit piecemeal. The development of some cleanup technologies has been underway more recently. In 2016, Japan's space agency sent a 700 meter tether into space to attempt to slow down and redirect space junk. In 2018, a device named Remove Debris successfully encircled a net around a dummy satellite. The European Space Agency is also planning to launch a self-destructing robot into orbit in 2025, which their former Director General has described as a space vacuum cleaner. The Japan-based company Astroscale has already launched a vehicle called ELSA-D in lower Earth orbit, which uses a magnetic system to capture a tricky target satellite while spinning and tumbling. In time, larger objects will be seized with a robotic arm. Of course, these devices have also attracted interest from military planners who may be tempted to adapt the advanced technologies for surveillance, sabotage or warfare. Another Japanese company can give us hope for the future. Sumitomo Forestry 
is working with Kyoto University in developing 100% wood satellites by 2023. Wooden satellites would self-extinguish at the end of their missions without releasing harmful substances into the atmosphere or raining debris on the ground when they fall back to Earth, a space development with protecting our planet in mind.